Good morning and welcome to Broadcast to Post. I'm Jeff Sangpil, Chief Technologist here at Keycode Media. We ran out of time in our last live stream when we were discussing building a TV studio in 2021. So we thought we could do a follow-up episode dialing in on just the production control room. If you missed that first episode, we're going to include the link in the description and chat. We will be joined shortly by some of the greatest broadcast engineering minds on the Keycode Media team, discussing how we have successfully deployed over 700 audio, visual, broadcast, and production upgrade projects each year. We're going to be discussing trends, standards, and the things teams need to think about when building out a production control room. Before we get to that, quick commercial break. This is the story of the greatest audiovisual integrator and reseller, Keycode Media. They're a pretty amazing group of people. The Keycode Media team can tell you everything that you need to know about thousands of broadcast vendors and how it connects to your production infrastructure, instantly bringing 100 years of technical experience to your business. With Avid Nexus, you've got a number of connectivity choices you can have. Like our engineer, Jeff Sengpil. Jeff's team will walk clients through design and installations every single day will help you find the right thing, even if it's not the most expensive. If you're looking for a more compact solution, we could check out the Carbonite Ultra to better fit your needs. There's also RVK, the master of storage, or Grace Nahara, the logistics extraordinaire. We are showing the equipments on time and the tech will be there first thing in the morning. Oh wait, we almost forgot Zuri. She's from our finance team. Now you've seen five, five of our 80 employees collaborating with customers like yourself helping businesses across the United States from our multiple office locations. Customers like to do business with Keycode Media because when you purchase it, you know it's going to be set up, you know it's going to work, and you know that if anything goes wrong, we have your back. So the next time you're buying a widget you're not sure about, installing digital signage or conference room, integrating a fly pack, upgrading a machine room, or building a stadium, classroom, or studio, call us and we'll pick up and make sure it works every time. All right, enough with this stuff from the marketing team commercials. Let's get to the tech. Let's briefly revisit the core elements that make up a control room. Essential components in the control room. What are they? And what choices do you have? Video switchers. This is one of the first considerations in setting up a control space. It's where the technical director sits and runs the console. Some switchers are narrowly focused, yet extremely reliable for productions that can't have any failure. Read live on air. Other switchers take an all-in-one approach, providing you with a full suite of flexible software tools. How do you decide here? Graphics, from simple lower thirds to modern things like video wall control or tombstones that grow up out of the ground in your virtual set. The look and feel of your show is determined in your graphics. We're a long way from my first days where fonts were on chips that you needed to put into the CG before you could use them. Audio, without it, what you really have is just a surveillance system. What is cutting edge for studio and sound mixing? And how do things like live surround sound change the choices you may need to make here? Comm systems, who in production can hear whom? The nerve center of making any production happen is in its communication system while you're in production. Replay systems, for sports that need play out, of that last clip, maybe even in slow motion, which goes hand in hand with in just in play out. Production often has pre-produced segments. How are those fed into the setup? And some productions aren't live. They ingest multiple cameras and record them, as well as a line feed for later post-production prior to delivery. I worked on soaps that have used ingest for post in a production environment. Edit will capture anyone. Encoders and decoders. Decoders help receive remote video signals from outside of your TV studios, like satellite trucks and live view cellular fly packs. The encoders send picture back to them. Control room video walls. A variety of reference monitors hung on custom brackets, which help your control room team visually manage all the video and audio components in a broadcast. All right, we're getting into our panel discussion now. I'm going to ask a variety of questions, but first, who's here? John Furter, 
is the VP for Broadcast Engineering for Keycode Media. John has over 35 years of experience in the broadcast industry, most notably as Director of Studio and Post-Production Engineering for the CBS Television Network in New York. John was responsible for the design, construction, and support of all production and post-production facilities in the CBS Broadcast Center, including the renovations for The Late Show with David Letterman, NFL Today, 60 Minutes, 48 Hours, CBS Evening News, as well as the new studio for CBS This Morning. John is a SMPTE Fellow and chairs the David Sarnoff Medal Award Committee. Mason Pierce. Mason has over 10 years of experience working in all aspects of media and broadcast production. He started his career at Tribune Media Group, managing 4K post and editorial environments and three HD production studios. Mason successfully managed the integration of a multi-million dollar new construction contracts with extremely complex workflows along with tight deadlines. Mario Heeb. Mario is a Society of Broadcast Engineers certified professional broadcast engineer with over 30 years of broadcast experience in radio, television, and live events, including ESPN, NBC, CBS, Fox, along with many others. He's previously done work broadcasting audio, video, and RF with the Utah Jazz, the Denver Nuggets, as well as the Olympic Games in Sydney, Salt Lake City, Athens, and Vancouver. He's also a contributing writer for Radio World and TV Technology. So now that we know who everyone is, after my initial questions, we'll be answering all of the audience questions. Please submit your questions at any time in the YouTube, Facebook, or the Vimeo embedded landing page chat. All right, let's get to this. All right, just realized we had some audio problems there. We are live uh, with my alternate microphone. Um, everybody should be able to hear me now. Uh, folks, you go ahead and unmute. Uh, let's start the centralized section with uh, probably video switchers. So what we'll do is we will have, um, we'll, we'll kind of gear each question toward one person and then anybody else can, uh, can kick in afterwards. So uh, the central focus of any control room usually is the video switcher. So uh, John, let's start with you. What are some of the key questions you ask to determine the best switcher for a build or an upgrade? Well, there's there's application. What what exactly are the programs you feel you want to produce? And then, of course, um, budget is always a consideration. There are so many options now with production switchers, uh, especially with the addition of NDI as a video format and also ST twenty one ten. So you know that runs the gamut of uh, applications. Uh, we're we're finding. For instance, in a lot of um, council chamber setups, uh, educational setups, house of worship setups, that a switcher like uh, a new tech TriCaster uh, is very applicable um, because the NDI gives you not only not only the video transport but also allows you to control hand tilt and zoom cameras um, for uh, more let's say higher level, higher budget uh, applications, universities, uh, sports applications, news applications. Um, many, uh, many of those are, are geared more towards what we'll call the traditional SDI type switcher, um, just for the, 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 regular, the regular normal workflow. Although we have seen in some of our projects for um, daytime talk shows, uh, that uh, TriCasters were used there as well. Um, so uh, we're we're seeing we're seeing it's it's we're seeing a lot more widespread application. Um, the other exciting thing I think about production switchers now is that um, Ross Video has combined their Ultrix router with the Carbonite switchers and the Acuity switchers, so that essentially the routing switcher is all of your production switcher inputs uh, that you can choose to produce with. And this gives you a lot of flexibility, especially if you're in a hybrid facility where you're part, where you're still part SDI, but also moving towards 2110, um, that uh, you can mix these sources within, this, within the same switcher. Um, so again, my, my, my larger questions are, um, what is your application? How often are you going to use this, this particular equipment? 
how many people do you have um, to produce your shows? Um, which of course also leads to the other questions that I'm sure we'll get to later. Uh, but uh, basically, it's, it's really a matter of, of sitting down and sussing out with, with the customer exactly what the applications and the needs are. Awesome. Um, Mason, uh, Mario, any thoughts on, on switchers there? Yeah, I think the switcher technologies are, are changing, um, or at least not necessarily fully changing, but there's new technologies coming into play uh, that are really pushing what traditionally a video switcher uh, position and it, or a TD position and really the piece of equipment itself can actually do. So collapsing positions into a single position where a TD is actually running graphics, you know, uh, playback and other uh, other components of the show. Um, so bot man count and body power is definitely, or manpower is definitely a big piece of that conversation. But I really mentioned the fact that switcher technology is changing because we're seeing like, as we see Ross start to integrate their switchers into their routing frames, still FPGA based. Most switchers are going to be that FPGA based in the traditional side of things, but we're seeing more and more solutions come to light kind of mimicking what new tech had been doing for a long time, which was software based. So now you're taking these signals in and using a software engine to mix everything. Um, Panasonic started doing the same with Kairos. Um, so now you're not actually looking at a traditional FPGA based baseband in, baseband out. You're looking at a server that has an IO card and that server is actually a software defined piece, not necessarily dedicated hardware for that processing, whether it be a DVE effect, uh, chroma, keys, matting, whatever. Um, so I think that's another interesting thing to keep your eye on. As we, I feel like I say this every single time, as broadcast, uh, corporate, education, as all of these technologies start, or our technologies, our world media entertainment starts bridging the gap towards typical IT infrastructure type systems, servers, networking, and that's kind of what things are running on. Very cool. Um... So one of the other things that pops up as these things kind of amalgamate and democratize uh, automation systems in, in your production environment. So Mason, in, in 2021, how has automation changed the people and the roles inside of a control room? Do you think it's different for news versus a, a school or a, 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 you know, a live venue or any other application? Do you think collaboration has really changed as we've, if we, as we've moved into this? Yeah, most certainly. I mean, as as the buzzword of our of our current last couple of years is with COVID and the fact that we've had to bring manpower down in locations, uh, give more space, and even move positions that were typically all in one environment out to external environments, whether that be your living room um, or ancillary spaces within that production facility. I definitely would say things have been changing over the last couple of years. I think everyone's kind of reacting to what do we have to do to actually throw the show and how do we accomplish it in a safe way. Um, automation has often actually, what I've found recently, found its way into upgrades worth on sites that never really thought they would need or want automation because they're needing to lower the body count within the control rooms and actually operate a production or a show with fewer bodies and automation can really help bridge that gap. Um, I definitely, you know, I like to look at this when it, when it comes to automation positions, whether it's remote, whether it's on premise or whatever, whatever it might be is ultimately, you know, what are your facility requirements? Um, what do you have to work with? What are your expectations from your you know, enterprise, whether that's corporate or broadcast or whatever it might be. So that way, as we approach control room builds that are either net new or being upgraded, we can build in those automation pieces where it makes sense. We can build in those remote pieces where it makes sense. And I definitely see uh, automation playing a bigger game uh, as we you know, further this kind of technology increase. People were all, often people were nervous of automation or the additional work and pre-prep it takes to make automation run successfully. And people are delving into it and finding it's much more palatable than they had initially thought on the onset. So we're seeing automation in more places than we've ever seen. We're also seeing a lot of remote operator uh, being introduced in the in the modern times that we are living in. 
Very cool. Uh, John, any, any thoughts on news automation? Well, I think, I think that's where we've really seen the biggest impact of automation overall. Um, I mean, you, 15, 10 years ago, there were a dozen people in a control room doing a local news show. Uh, now you walk in and there might be three um, because automation systems such as Ross Overdrive or Sony ELC uh, into, uh, work with ENPS or with Avid iNews so that you can, by using the script, uh, your new script, you're automating you're, you're automating all of the takes, all of the effects on your switcher. You're automating camera moves. You're automating your graphics. Um, you're automating your audio, turning people's mics on and off if they if they're on or off the air. Um, and that's that's had a that's had a major impact. Um, I was um, prior to joining Keycode Media, I was working uh, with a religious broadcaster, uh, and they were using a script system with Overdrive uh, to do their nightly news show. Uh, again, three or four people in the control room, uh, they had the extra person in uh, because they were operating the prompter and uh, they weren't counting on, they weren't counting on the talent to use a foot pedal to run their own prompter. But again, the reduction in staff there, and it's very, very efficient. Uh, and once, you know, as Mason said, once, uh, once it's properly configured, uh, which is for uh, a fair amount of people uh, easy enough to do on their own, or you know, you work with the, the manufacturer. Uh, once that's all set up, it pretty much runs on its own without much adjustment. So, um, I think news news really has had the biggest uh, the biggest bonus from automation. Very cool. Well, you mentioned graphics there, so let's let's get into that side of it. <clears throat> so, uh, Mario, in graphics, what are some of the new cool new technologies that are being implemented today? What do we need to consider if we want a functional virtual set uh, systems and the people that we build for? And um, how have displays inside of arenas changed the way you set up graphic systems for sports venues? A project that we're currently working on, we we designed a very low budget. Uh, green, uh, green screen stage and uh, LED lighting, uh, you know, to make way for a virtual set uh, with no thoughts of, you know, a conventional set. Uh, for larger budgets, uh, vendors like Ross, uh, they can provide a turnkey virtual production facilities where the cameras and the graphics machines are well integrated. Uh, speaking of Ross, Last week, um, we installed a Ross expression at the University of Wyoming Athletics Control Room. And now this expression was NDI compatible. Um, and it, we, we chose this expression because uh, as a main switcher and control surface, they're using the uh, new tech TriCaster, which is, uh, you know, has a proprietary NDI um, format that's that's used for networking and, and delivering the signals. It took about ten, uh, 15 minutes to put this expression in the rack, and it took about another 10 minutes to commission it. And then about five minutes later, uh, we were keying a team logo over the video through the TriCaster. So uh, very user friendly. <clears throat> as far as uh, sports projects, I've worked on quite a few sports um, video productions over the years. And uh, a few years ago, I worked at a project at the Utah Jazz where they they took 12 Ross Expression units um, that were installed to drive uh, what we called a halo, which was a very large circular shaped video display that covered the interior of the arena at mid height. Now, if you've ever been to Disneyland and have seen the circle vision there, uh, this display was much, much larger than that, than that display. Uh, it was all run by the Ross Expressions uh, feeding spider units and uh, really creates a very stunning uh, visual effect within, within the arena. Very cool. I mean, that's also why I know exactly when I go to Dodger Stadium, who is sponsoring that inning, you know, what, what particular uh, venue. 
Um, any other thoughts on graphics from um, John or, or Mason? Well, I think the the other the other thing too that's that's impressed me over the last uh, number of years is if you go to a, a sports stadium like Yankee Stadium or or City Field, um, there's a broadcast control room, and then there's a graphics control room that has a lot of the similar equipment for all different purposes. So it's totally a completely separate production. Um, and just the um, the length to which uh, people like major league teams, universities uh, are, are going to provide really high quality graphics um, uh, is is an exciting development and, and a great challenge for for us uh, as uh, systems integrators to uh, to provide to our clients. I think I'm jumping in, Jeff. Sorry, but we're going one more with graphics here. So I think it, one interesting thing in graphics that I've seen is, as I've come along is, you know, entry into graphics and CG isn't what it used to be. And you can, I mean, from the advent of like new Blue Titler for the Avid folks and new tech folks that have leveraged that type of tool, very low cost, very simple to get some basic CG elements on there. And we have systems that go, you know, like the Ross side that can drive large boards, click effects, which can drive large scoreboards and, and mixed formats, not mixed formats, sorry, but mixed frame sizes that aren't a traditional video frame size are often driven by these systems. So that's one thing to kind of keep in your head that if I have this unique, whether it's a Spadia or an LED or some custom shaped uh, canvas, if you will, and you want to do something unique and interesting with it that you can adjust and trigger and it's not just a digital signage type element graphic systems are actually very useful in those types of applications and don't need to necessarily break the bank obviously depending on your canvas and complexity um, the other piece that i've found interesting in graphics is the ability to over over time we've seen links into data sources so like the first thing that comes into mind is like ross's data link uh, the ability for graphic systems to query RSS feeds, to query uh, existing Google Docs. So maybe you have a grid that shows all of your talent and that way all of those graphics are actually pre-built and looking at some third party data source to drive the creation of those graphics on the fly. Uh, systems have been using that for some time, but that's definitely something that's that's happening in the graphics world and sometimes a, use, a very useful licensable feature that's often overlooked um, and can create tons of simplifications and efficiencies within your graphics workflow. And one of the places we see those advances is every four years when, when we throw a presidential election, uh, that's where the technology really, the next leap forward, we, we start to see it. Um, Mason, getting into replay, ingest, play out, um, what flexibility do you think these systems need to have as the infrastructure evolves? You know, if you're dealing with sports, you know, variable speed, instant replay, or just clear clip playback, or you know, what questions are you asking to discover what the best systems are to fit for a facility, venue, or production capacity and access that sort of stuff? Absolutely. Um, I mean, I, I like to start that one with with really defining the need. Oftentimes, somebody comes to us and it's like, oh, I need this, all this replay, and all of these elements, and then it really boils down to all they're really looking to do is ingest and be able to play back at a later date on a later production. Um, so identifying the proper systems, because when you start looking at replay, especially into HFR, so high frame rates, so sports applications, absolutely, some of those systems dollars start going up based off the capabilities. So understanding from a core concept of what is your real need for replay? Is it in on, on demand instantaneous replay? Are you going to have somebody logging? Are you, what types of clips and media are we working with, or sorry, content are we working with? Um, I found that there's a lot of efficiencies that can also be created in the replay side of the world. So if you are, hey, I, I need to solve my ingest problem, I need to solve a logging problem, and then I also need to have some component of replay, instead of doing those in desperate systems, you can gain efficiencies from actually bringing that all under one hood. A lot of manufacturers that are, you know, kind of your re replay, uh, replay powerhouses, such as EVS, Everts, uh, Ross has Mira, all those 
um, they're starting to integrate abilities for user interfaces for like a corporate user who you look at it and you're like, well, why would a corporate user ever want replay? Um, but oftentimes some of these small EP event spaces, event production type spaces, they have a talent monitor, the talent's doing some free court pre capture, and he wants to see what his last take just looked like. And replay systems can be a great way to leverage, oh, I'm gonna just bounce this back to the talent monitor and he can go ahead and take take a look at what he just did and then out, out we go. So there's more usage for replay than just the traditional mindset of here's this great play that I just saw in this soccer game, football game, basketball game, and I wanna replay that for some highlight reel or whatever I'm doing or just that instantaneous replay that fans have come to love, uh, there's applications beyond it. You can also leverage those systems for ingest only. You can leverage those systems for logging and other elements of that nature. So looking at defining what your needs are, what frame rates do I need? What's it, do I need to be able to zoom or, or crop or do any sorts of other effects to this replay uh, content? Or am I just looking at more simple ingest only playback when needed, but not on the instantaneous type of uh, timeline? So uh, I think replay is one of those pieces that's commonly, oh, no, 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 we don't need that. But there might be elements of a replay system that will actually do you great service in your productions. Yeah, and I've been in the situation where, you know, they go to do the, the live in front of audience pre-tape and they discover that the actual Rehearsal the night before was a lot better, and someone asks the EVS operator. The EVS operator looks and says, "Oh yeah, yeah, I got that. All all eight cameras. It's just in the system. We'll we'll pull that and we'll use that instead of the uh, this pre-tape that we're trying to do." Uh, John, any other thoughts on on these these types of systems? Um, yeah, I think the, the, the other the other questions I, I ask are, you know, building on Mason's uh, you know use cases. Uh, are the clips that you're ingesting one use only and then going to be dumped? Uh, are you going to maintain them for a while? So, so we can try to calculate best um, storage space, uh, storage size, um, uh, and then also, uh, also what type of drives you're going to store on. You know, in some cases, you know, real heavy-duty replay. Um, you're probably looking at a large cache of solid state drives as opposed to something a lot smaller where you know hard disk drives are still adequate and then also in, in some cases if it's real simple logo and um, basic uh, clip playback a number of production switchers have a fair amount of storage in them now that you could store those clips uh you know and then just recall them with a macro or push button and in some cases there's a need to take that captured ingest material and kick it to archive because right, exactly. monetize that content later. Um, so getting into audio and communications, uh, Mario, as live productions evolved over the last year, which has been uh, quite an evolution, um, it showed this necessity to expand comm outside the bubble of just the control room um, for a lot of people outside of the traditional sports folks who always have been doing that. Has that experience changed the way you think about comms for production control rooms today? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you mentioned sports and, uh, you know, we, we had fairly large intercom systems for sports for many years. If you're doing golf or auto racing, you know, they might, you might have to talk to somebody a mile or two away. Uh, and then there's always been a, dial-up circuit back to the to the network uh, to talk to their other com. Uh, I think, yeah, we're going to see a lot more changes, uh, especially integrated with uh, Zoom calls like what we're doing right now. Uh, it would be kind of nice. I can I can hear program audio on my little speaker here uh, in my little studio, but it, it might be nice to hear our producer uh, do some talk back, you know, uh, you know, telling us uh, speed up, slow down, shut up. I don't know, whatever the case. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see. I'm sure uh, companies like ClearCom and RTS are probably working on, on the very problem right now. Uh, you know, we have audio, we have video. Now let's let's get the other pieces of it. Let's get let's get the intercom and the IFBs and that sort of thing. 
transition from comms moving. I mean, you see all of these manufacturers, ClearCom, RTS, Riedel, uh, into your favorite comm system, uh, moving towards AES 67 for these exact reasons Mario's pointing out. It's that, hey, we're now spanning, uh, you know, multi-location, multi-site distances greater than even a couple miles. We're all used to the comms of, oh, bring in two ways, bring in telephony, bring in all these different uh, uh, communications aspects. And really the comms world has been, uh, you know, doing that for a very long time. Uh, that's definitely something that's been integrated as part of comms. But now the ability to streamline that over a network-based protocol, especially as all of our telephony systems have gone VoIP as far as to collaborators like Zoom and Skype and Teams and whatever the other tools might be, using those types of uh, you know network distributed audio will really help solve a lot of those problems of how am I bringing these desperate desperate pieces together and making them play happy in all the in this ecosystem. It's also opening up the ability to get beyond just okay IFB was this mix minus and that's that and. You know, getting more into this is a little more complicated. Now we're seeing comm systems can drive and bring in, you know, full MADI lines from existing audio mix. And you're actually getting full program, mix minuses, other elements in an ISO form. So you can actually start moving those around in your comm system appropriately. Again, all courtesy of the nature of AES 67 based audio network distributed audio. So I think that's a very exciting piece. Um, obviously, I always like to harp on comm systems for integration into uh, more user-friendly type uh, interfaces. So we have a lot of guys asking for Bluetooth and things like that. I haven't seen that from a lot of folks. Riedel's really been the only one that I've been impressed with on some of that aspect. But I think more and more we're going to see those comms devices uh, like ClearCom has an app on your phone. Uh, so you can actually use your phone as your comms device. So using more uh, standard technology, if you will, uh, that's not specific to a production or specific to a system uh, where, oh, I'm, I can Bluetooth my existing headset into this and now I can communicate with my team. Uh, that's another exciting thing I like to push on those comms folks. And let's you know keep moving that ball down up the hill, if you will, because that's something that just makes everyone's lives easier. Uh, and more usable, especially now that no one wants to share headsets, no one wants to share in-ears, no one wants to share these types of devices, as much so as we had seen in the past. That also speaks to how has audio itself evolved uh, in production environments over the last couple of years. Any, any yeah. thoughts on that? Yeah, um, there are some new tools uh, like the Ross Ultrix router, which we talked about a little bit earlier. Uh, which is really a very small form factor router. Uh, I first looked at it and I said, where's the audio? <laughs> where, where, where are the audio connections for this router? Uh, doing a little bit of uh, research into it, I found out that it's, it's done through an SFP port and then it's all done in MADI, uh, which yeah, it's a different way to do uh, audio workflows, but we, we just put one in in a facility and it, it seems to work just fine. And there are definitely advantages to that. If you're building a TV truck and every inch of the TV truck is, is valuable, your router doesn't have to be as big. You know, your, your audio part of the system doesn't have to be that big. You can use, use that extra space for other things in the plant. Yeah, I think it's as we're seeing audio moving towards distributed network or just being distributed through a network versus your traditional analog or digital audio systems. Um, there's still a lot coming together with Dante being on AS67, but using kind of their own proprietary uh, interconnection. You've got AES67 in the mix. You've got other manufacturers that are also doing some of their own proprietary. So like Wheatnet and things of that nature. Um, seeing all of those start to come together for interoperability, right? And that's a piece that we're now seeing, you know, if you want to kind of look at what happened, what's happening with video and where we're headed, you can really look at what some of the audio aspect has happened because they kind of were a little bit early on to that bandwagon. Um, you see a lot of flavors right now. They can work together. It takes a little bit more finesse or tweaking, um, tuning, if you will, to get it all to play nice. Um, but working towards that interoperability. And then it's simultaneously, 
that interoperability of that network-based audio to network-based video. And so now we're starting to create, as Mario brings up, hey, now we have these systems that are handling our video, handling our audio, and allowing us to mix those in really any way we see fit. Um, gives a lot of flexibility and power to the user. Uh, sure, some complexity. Now your routers are you know, not just this control panel that you're using. Okay, I'm going to use Dante to route some of this. Okay, I'm going to use this to redirect some of these streams. Um, so getting a handle on keeping track of all those pieces is a little bit different and sometimes it definitely takes a departure from your traditional audio workflows. But the benefits that are gained are certainly there and certainly viable and worthwhile as you make those updates and, and efforts. That all being said, and this is a joke I told to Mario when we were doing our thing, uh, a lot of times, you know, it depends on what that audio source is. We're not saying that networked audio is the end all be all. You still need to have solid preamps. You still need to have solid audio processing. We're not talking about replacing advanced DSPs. We're not talking about replacing mixed positions and things of that nature. Now, does it simplify our ability to get that signal in and out of those DSPs, mixed positions, so on and so forth? Absolutely. But always bear in mind when working on audio that you want to be sure that you know what is my audio source? Is it going to an appropriate type tool before I get it in my distributed network uh, so for others to use? Cool. And while, while we're in this topic, uh, we had a question come in from Mike Krim. Um, viewpoints on the top four providers that manage live comms in a mixed production environment, which includes new on-prem control room and team members who are working from home, comms including intercom, mix minus, and interrupt. So uh, they're at, somebody's actually asking for what vendors fit here. I mean, honestly, all the vendors really have a solution, to be honest. ClearCom has gateways into public and internet, uh, RTS as well, and the Atom line. Um, obviously, Riedel as well. They all have a play there. Uh, some degree, you know, I, it, I always look at comms. First off is, you know, is there an existing installation in your facility? Because bridging mold, desperate manufacturers of comm systems can get sticky, and it's not really a position you want to put much of anybody into. Um, now, if it's a net new build greenfield, it's all about looking at the features and the ease of how it is to integrate those pieces that you might be looking at. You know, with, for example, a clear comm by socket, or, uh, system, okay, I need to get this gateway to get this out, to get this onto public, to get this over here. And on this other system, I can actually do that natively via, via its onboard NIC that's actually feeding all my panels and everything else can feed a far edged WAN uh, position. So looking at those, like having kind of your, your goals and your needs in your mind as you start to vet those technologies, absolutely highly recommended. And it will help whittle down which of those is, you know, the best fit for your particular applications. But to be honest, I, I in my opinion, think that pretty much along the lines of, you know, those big, those big group of comms folks, they all are keeping pretty well in lockstep with features and functionality um, as, as they evolve. Very cool. So let's get back to the, the spectacle in the control room, which is the, the video wall in front of everybody. Um, John or Mason, uh, what are some of the best setups individual uh, you want to go with individual monitors or larger multi views and how does your selection of a routing switcher play into how you're making those decisions regarding multi view well in, in most cases we're um we're seeing um multiple displays usually in the neighborhood of 46 to 55 inches um that are tiled out from uh multi viewers um, in some cases for critical signals, uh, for instance, at the camera shader, uh, and then at the TD and director station for preview and program, um, you're using, you, people still use uh, individual dedicated um, OLED monitors for, for critical evaluation. But even that, even that's uh, melding into the multi-viewers. Um, the, the choice of the, I think of the amount of monitors and how it affects uh, your, how you're setting up your multi-view is how many people, how many people in how many different areas need to see certain signals. 
in many cases, um, the production switcher itself can accommodate the number of multi viewers that you have. Um, but in a facility where you're bringing in a lot of outside feeds um, that you would route through a routing switcher, um, perhaps even as soft inputs instead of hard inputs to the production switcher, then it, it's, it makes more sense to run your multi-viewer out of your routing switcher because then that way you can, you can uh, in better detail set up different tiles uh, for the different uh, viewers. You can dedicate particular feeds. You can you can have uh, individual uh, individuals in the control room change feeds to individual tiles on the fly. It, it, that that in and of itself gives you more flexibility. Um, so I I always think it's it works better um, if you have a routing switcher in your control room to use the routing switcher as your multi viewer. Uh, again, because you have that multiplicity of inputs um, that that you can monitor. Yeah, and I'm uh, going back to, to I don't know what I did with my audio. All right, going back to like the wall itself. Uh, you know, I I agree. I I see more independent, like consumer even prosumer. Uh, display types going in. For example, LG, you can buy consumer LG OLEDs that you can actually calibrate. Uh, low cost of low cost panel, easy to replace. Uh, sure, you're going to have the bezels and you're going to have that breakup in your wall. Um, so that's the type of things that I'm seeing a lot of just for the cost uh, nature of it all. Now, in a flagship control room, still seeing a lot of LED. Uh, pixel pitch matters. You need to look at your viewing positions, viewing angles. What are we working with in this area? Um, but certainly, I don't see that that's totally disappeared from the market, but there are certainly more cost effective routes to approach that. Um, and we've seen consumer, prosumer display actually take a, a you know pretty big, pretty big share of that monitor wall scenario. Um, being able to service panels independently versus have an LED wall that now, okay, this chunk of it's not working, but I have to get an LED wall tech to come in and now he's working on this whole wall uh, versus, oh, this panel's dead. We're in a production, that panel's dead. We're shifting some multi-views around and we can keep moving. Um, and then when we get this serviced, we can actually service it in a modular fashion. Um, obviously, a lot of the LED walls are modular, um, but you don't have to have that, you know, expert technician or LED technician that's a highly, you know, highly skilled set, right? Um, I would say I echo John's sentiments on, on the multi-view and, and having the, you know, ease of flexibility. Um, big thing for me, like he kind of mentioned, is positions. Where are these positions? What is their relationship to the multi-view or to the monitor wall? What are, what's our multi-view counts? Are we leveraging dedicated multi-viewers? Are we leveraging switcher-based multi-viewers? Um, even to some degree, as John mentioned, using a routing switcher um, to handle some of the multi-view, using your facility routing switcher uh, to actually output duplicates of inputs into multi-view systems is another thing that manufacturers have been doing an awful lot of. Uh, it comes to mind Everts X-Link, Ultrix does it natively inside of their router on specific outputs that you select to drive specific multi-view heads. Um, having that multi-viewer, if you will, embedded or being driven off of a route or routing switcher cross point or the routing switcher itself gives you huge advantages to not eating up outputs of your router to feed external multi-views to then have to dedicate those. The routing becomes a little easier for you. Um, and leveraging those types of systems whenever possible, you're already, you know, probably have a facility router or you're probably investing in a facility router. Uh, looking at those pieces of technology and leveraging the additional capabilities without having to purchase external hardware is huge. Uh, also helps for the fact that now you have all of your sources available to you without needing to go make a route out to an external piece and then net now adjust my multi-viewer to my liking. Um, so definitely cool steps in the tech or, you know, cool progression in the technology in our capabilities of being able to monitor and control um, those productions. 
Very cool. So let's get into a few more audience questions. Uh, first one I'm going to handle because it actually has to do with what we're doing here in Burbank. Um, Martin Lorenzo is asking, in the seminar, what platform are you using to communicate? Zoom or Google Meets? Um, the four of us are in a Zoom room. Uh, that is how we can hear each other and our mix, mix minus audio is handled correctly. What you can't see are the two hidden people, one of which is our TriCaster 2. So our TriCaster 2 is what's creating the four-way split. So you see, you know, Mason down there, John over there, and Mario over there. Am I pointing the right way? No, no, he's over there. Backwards. Uh, so the, the actual picture with the, the background, that's coming off the TriCaster 2, but our primary communications and messaging is happening through Zoom as it's it just makes it a heck of a lot easier than setting up um, RTS feeds going all over the place. We could do it, but you know, throwing up a Zoom call is a lot quicker sometimes than digging into the d digging into the higher tech ways of, of knocking something out. Um, so the folks at Mountain View Baptist Church are asking, what are the best options for integrating frame sizes? You know, 4K, 1080p, 720p, but all getting down into a 1080p output. That's that's a tough challenge. <laughs> Definitely, you know. Uh, Production switchers, obviously, in many cases, will have frame syncs. Now, you're not going to be able to handle a lot of those, you know, large frame size differences because a routing switcher will be in a mode. So you're running in HD mode, you're running in UHD mode. Um, we've come across this in a number of places, like as an example, sports venues where their camera systems are all going to be UHD, high frame rate. But at the end of the day, for their house mix that's hitting all of the suites and all of the screens around the stadium, it's just 1080p, or not even 1080p in some cases, it's 720 or 1080i. How do we go about managing that? Um, oftentimes, terminal gear is just simply required. Um, you're gonna have signals, you, they're wilds, right? That's what I like calling them, wild signals coming in. It's not my facilities standard, but I need to play with this signal in some way, shape, or form. Project Products like AJA FSs, the FS, I don't even know which number they're on now. I have just did a bunch of HDRs recently, but they've got FS4, four channel boxes, threes, twos. Those frame sync devices can also do standards conversion. Uh, we'll also do terminal gear to handle some standards conversion to get it into the proper standard and then rely on a local frame sync, whether that's in the production switcher or even the product or even the routing switcher uh, can also do some of that frame syncing. Um, but oftentimes with those wild type cases, you are going to have, have to have some complement of whether it be up, down, cross. Um, sometimes it's not even frame sizes that you're struggling with. It's, and I don't, I'm sure no one wants me to go here, but it's SDR versus HDR, and how am I getting these to play together nicely so my picture doesn't look crazy as I get an HDR up and then I cut to an SDR, or I have two different HDR formats in the same production. Uh, Mario probably played a lot with a lot of that in the Olympics. I know that's definitely something that was a, a, a fun challenge, let's say, that NBC faced and, and others had faced during that uh, HDR versus SDR and how do we do HLG, PQ, HDR10, you know, which format flavor. And it's all, unfortunately, since it's still new, certain manufacturers only do certain flavors. So you do kind of get trapped in some points uh, to have to put in some of that outboard gear to handle some of these wilds. Very cool. Um, Chuck H has a question about uh, rules of thumb for maintaining lip sync. So one of the, the one of the core things you want to do is try to get your audio and video in sync as early in the chain as possible. So for for our purposes here, I'm actually looking at a camera head that's it's ahead of me. Um, it is being run through a converter from Bird Dog that turns everything in NDI. However, as we crossed over to the Q and A, my lavalier microphone failed. So now I'm actually talking through my laptop. So I have two different possible sources and I'm, in, I'm I'm muxing the two together later down the chain. So you may actually be seeing a little bit of lip flap from me because the sources are not embedded at the same point. So I, I think that's one of the primary things. Try to get things in sync as far up the chain as possible 
so that you don't have to worry about it lower lower down. And there are ways to maintain or to ad adjust for lip flap or lip sync later on in, in, in the production infrastructure. Yeah, definitely make sure you put your delays in, right? So agreed on the signal, marry those signals up to keep those guys in sync as much as possible. Oftentimes that just simply isn't an option. So for example here, uh, I'm in, I've got my hard hat on, I'm, I'm here on a site, I'm here at Austin PBS, so famous for Austin City Limits. Austin City Limits is quite an interesting production because we're doing a rock show on television. Uh, a lot of audio sources. That audio gets brought through a desk, processed, and obviously we care about that high fidelity audio because it is a rock show. The audio is the, really the cool part about it. Obviously the visual is, is vastly important for broadcast, but we want to have ultimate control of that audio especially working with bands, they really care how they sound. They have effects racks, they have processing, they have all of this that gets put into the chain, which actually creates delays and little bits of processing. Same thing with video. So tracking your video path and processing on your video path as it relates to tracking your audio path and the delays that are introduced through processing in your audio path. Oftentimes it's, you know, that's where you rely on your friendly systems integrators like Keycode Media to who have the knowledge, worked with these devices and know what's the expected delay through these particular processing points. Yeah. And then timing that and making sure you have the proper delays in your system to be able to accommodate those processing delays, whether that be on video or audio path or potentially both. Yeah, as far as rule of thumbs go, um, video is usually going to be behind audio because of the bandwidths uh, involved in the signals. Um, and so usually what you do is you add the delay to the audio to get the lip uh, sync in sync. Uh, one of the things about that's nice about embedded uh, audio embedded in video is once you embed it and it goes through transmission and all the various transmission uh, delays, uh, it does it together. The audio is always in sync with the video at that point. So look at um, embedding your video just, just when you go to transmission. Uh, look at that. And um, the, the manufacturer, terminal gear manufacturers, uh, we brought up Everts a couple of times, uh, but manufacturers like Everts in their terminal gear that go in their card frames. Uh, the audio embedders have been having more and more uh, audio processing uh, built in that's controllable um, either at the front panel or at the front of the card itself, which is can be kind of clunky or, or through, for instance, with Ebert's, their, their Magnum control system. So you can, you can dial in quite a wide range of delay and do other um, other processing as well. You can you can do limiting and uh, and uh, checking levels and adjusting levels in the embedder itself. So th that's a very powerful tool. Awesome. So so moving on, um, Gerald is asking Black Magic at the low end and Ross at the high end. Both are uh, refusing to adopt NDI in any meaningful way. New tech is stuck in the middle. How can you future-proof a studio design around a standard that two of the major vendors are not currently backing? Well, is that true? Uh, <laughs> Expression oh. has, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Expression makes a box that is NDI compatible. There are no SDI outputs or inputs on it. So uh, I think that's one example of them embracing NDI. I think NDI is getting the slow embrace, like Panasonic just came out with Kairos, that's leveraging a lot of NDI as well. Um, as NDI, uh, you know, further expands, now with Blackmagic, that's a tough one. Blackmagic's kind of always been that in our industry, right? I mean, they came up with 6G for, for all intents and purposes before anyone even had a 6G spigot or doing anything with 6G. They had 12G stuff before 12G was a real thing. And a lot of that was, not even a real SMPTE standard. They were just kind of doing their own versions of things and making it work. Um, I think Blackmagic is always going to kind of be one of those that is its own ecosystem. I mean, you look at it, for example, their camera systems that can offer control. Well, you can't control those cameras unless you're using an ATEM switcher. Um, so really, 
though those components where I put black magic in it's it's oftentimes in those throwdown conversion terminal types items that play nicely with anything no matter what it is otherwise you know you decide to go the black magic route you are definitely marrying yourself to that black magic route I think NDI will continue to evolve I think it will continue to permeate our industry and aspects um, mm -hmm. even to the point of maybe it's not you know like for example, the expression Mario brought up where it is just native NDI and only native NDI, often devices will have NDI capabilities while still supporting baseband and IP. Um, so those types of devices are handy to bridge some of those, those gaps, right? Bridge systems together. Um, it's wild west though. Like, I like that question because it's, we're, st we're in this great period of transition. We're transitioning to all of our systems being more network-based. We're transitioning to network-based distribution of signals. Um, NDI is one of those many flavors, 2110, 22-6, AES67. I mean, the flavors, there's a lot of them. Um, I think as time continues on, and again, I kind of hammered on this a little bit earlier, the interoperability part is something that is still out there it's still being worked on like obviously nmos and things of that nature iso 456 have helped bridge some of that but i don't think we're done and i think that's something that's going to ever you know progress further into our industry as we have seen a lot of buy-in from on the ndi front outside of new tech itself and i think one of the other important things here is also that the core thing where all of these technologies are beginning to meld isn't in a routing switcher it's actually in a uh, ip router you know cisco arista those folks so that's where the mixing of this is going to happen at the end and that's kind of where everything is going to end up dragging off to so if you're looking at future proofing regardless of what the formats are going to be because you, you there's digital glue you can buy to make that happen you know bird dog makes a ton of it we're using part of it here at the studio today but having a routing switcher that has a redundancy, which may mean you need two, um, and B, the bandwidth to handle all of these streams, um, which are packetized now or being packetized in short order, is a, a core thing that you need to look at. John, you were, I, I, I stepped on you. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, I was gonna say, I. You know, I, I definitely agree with Mason. NDI is evolving and becoming more and more embraced. NDI 5 uh, is coming out now. And I think as more major manufacturers like Panasonic, for instance, uh, embrace and try to use the technology that, um, that the um, standards bodies will uh, try to work with, you know, the developers of NDI. I, I don't know that they would make a hard and fast standard like ST2110 is, but certainly work in the arena of making things uh, more interoperable. And I think the other thing also is um, as things, as, as standards end up being adopted or, or as a, a method of connectivity ends up being adopted, the standards bodies end up adapting and saying yes we're going to need to turn this into something 12g has been along around for a long time and it's it's now in in committee at simpty right yes that's correct so it'll it'll soon be an official standard because it's just become ubiquitous so as ndi becomes ubiquitous it's the same thing's going to happen um right. you know because the, the the other fun thing is you know standards everybody's got them um and trying to figure out where everything's going to end up shaking out uh, and that's why I think it's also still important that it's going to still end up shaking out into a IP-based routing infrastructure. So that's that's the one thing you you know you want to buy with a very long look into your future. Um, all right, um, interesting. John Schilberg is asking: Is there a rule of thumb for calculating cost of ownership related to annual maintenance fees for control room rated gear, related gear? Um, there is, uh, you know, in, in many cases, what your costs turn out to be based on your staffing uh, and, and the abilities of your staff is the, um, 
the number of support contracts uh, that you uh, that you're going to invest in. Certainly, manufacturers uh, provide extending it would will be very happy to sell you extended warranties on their equipment. Uh, but then also here, uh, here at Keycode, uh, we offer all of our clients um, Keycode total care support contracts of varying levels based on um, phone support, uh, equip equip equipment warranties, uh, on-site visits, uh, et cetera. It's, um, it almost becomes more OPEX than CAPEX. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to try to age myself, but when, when I got into television and, you know, started, started working in television and started actually as a maintenance technician, Ford still had discrete components. Uh, and that's, that's changed so much. I mean, the, the, the evolution of circuit boards uh, over the last number of years has, has been extraordinary to the point where it's literally impossible, if not highly improbable for a maintenance technician to go in and fix it unless it's a software issue. Um, so a lot of that too is calculating the cost of, you know, okay, so I've, you know, I've bought, I've bought a brand new production switcher. Is it worth my while? Is it worth the investment to buy a spare parts kit? Is it worth the while to buy a spare boards kit? Um, a lot of that is determined by how quick does your how quick does your turnaround need to be? I mean, if you're a 24 hour news channel and you've got to be on the air, you're definitely going to you're definitely going to invest in things like that because something breaks, you have to fix it. You have to fix it before it broke. Right. Uh, whereas if you're. If you're more in, if you're more on the industrial side or the educational side and you have some time to be able to do warranty repairs or warranty swaps. Um, you know, you can, you know, you can budget for that. So I think that's, that's the way you calculate it is, is the criticality of the equipment, um, how, you know, with, to what extent you use it in a, in a typical day. Um, and yes, it, it can, it can get pricey depending on the, uh, the product, but again, risk versus reward. It cost me ten thousand dollars to get a new board. How much is it going to cost me if I'm off the air for eight hours? And, and I think another interesting thing that comes into play there is hardware and the license to make software work are two separate things. So if I buy the hardware, you know, you know, a, a grass two hundred switcher from you know some odd years ago. Um, you, you put it in, you needed people to maintain it, you may need to buy a components, but at no time does the hardware ever stop working because your software license is expired. It just simply did and it kept doing forever. Um, or, you know, as long as, you, as long as you maintained it, it was good, or they didn't change the standards out and it suddenly needed to be HD. Um, in today's day and, war, you know, day and age, <clears throat> there is certain pieces of hardware you buy. And if the license to make that software work works for what it does today in perpetuity, that's a pretty good deal. You don't need to necessarily make any further investments into the software unless you need support to fix something that has broken software wise, or you need the latest software updates to do this next new cool thing. It will, you know, features get added on um, in software updates that allow hardware platforms to do something different. So if you've got that sort of a, a perpetual license model, okay, it's if, if you're gonna lock in your infrastructure to just do these things, and it's just gonna do that for a long time, uh, that's, that's your cost. If you know that you're gonna need to continually update this and the next version of software is gonna need to be there, or you have a, a licensing model that expires, like your production switcher stops working on the 31st of a month, um, you need to figure that, yes, there's going to be this cost. And the rule of thumb, I would say at that point is figure 20%, your net purchase cost um, at MSRP. At, you know, take that, turn that into a 20% figure. That's your year over year licensing if you need to have those software updates or you've got a model where you need to make sure that the license gets renewed each year, otherwise it stops working. Um, so I, I would just say 20% there, 
but look for things that are perpetual or don't need that sort of level of, of changes uh, because you know there's plenty of people who are working on hardware that has licenses that are old and they've just been printing money with it because they haven't needed to make any changes they don't need anything cool new and different the other, other uh, thing, I'll the more ahead, you man. get into the digital domain uh, the more you're faced with that problem <laughs> and yes. Uh, a lot of times, you the only way you can make it work is with software patches. So you may be better off um, keeping some things like audio in the in the analog domain in certain situations. And I'd be interested to know Austin City Limits how much of what they do is still analog and how much is AES CBU, how much is Dante, and how much is Maddie. Yeah. One piece I was going to say too to kind of round this one out is definitely your uh, because we talked about support and the ROI on support. Interview your manufacturers. Get to know the manufacturers that you're about to invest in because that's something that like if you know another site or a partner that you've worked with or you need references from somebody like your integrator like ourselves. We have clients and customers that love to talk to other people about the stuff that they have and their experience with it. Um, support is one of those big investments, especially in control room type equipment that's mission critical. And oftentimes, you know, that's an expensive piece of gear. That's going to be an expensive piece of gear to maintain support on. Um, is the ROI there, though? Have I interviewed this manufacturer? Do I feel comfortable with the level of support that they're going to be able to give me? Do other people that also have this equipment have a good experience with their support from that manufacturer? And then furthermore, identifying manufacturers, and I love that the question came from John, um, identify manufacturers that maybe have longer term included manufacturer support, such as Utah Scientific uh, with like their 10 year support program that you don't have to pay for. So oftentimes that is something that you should consider as you're shopping for your systems. Uh, if this is mission critical and I do need this under support, make that a part of your conscious decision making as you look and vet at this technology, because it might very well price you out on a specific manufacturer if you are planning to carry support for a five, 10 year term, uh, where another manufacturer might be able to give that to you at no cost or a lower cost and actually provide a better quality of care. Uh, so definitely something that's I highly advise at looking into. That also brings up one of the interesting things. There's a difference between the total cost of ownership and your return on investment. And the difficulty with production gear a lot of the times is it sits idle for a good chunk of time because no one's in actually doing a production. If it's a daily show, then yeah, you've got a lot more folks, but if you're looking at a facility that does something weekly or uh, you know on occasion the 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 return on the investment actually goes down now if you're getting a lot of uh, value out of what you're building for then you know that that kind of works out but that's that's also been one of the challenges that a lot of people have been trying to do is centralizing production space because they know that okay you know fox is only going to use the facility monday through wednesday maybe they could let lease it out to you know, an NBC or a CBS, you know, Thursday through through Sunday. Um, that's that's the thing that's that's interesting there with you know facilities these days. Um, Joe is asking for multi-view. Are you using a video routing switcher or is this over IP? Well, can be both. Multi-views have certainly started to. There's definitely multi-view manufacturers now that are starting to create multi-view that are IP native, so 2110. Um, baseband native multi-viewers have been around for a very long time. And then we kind of touched base a little bit on embedded multi-view, which is actually happening off the route, switching router um, or even a production router. You can use a multi-view out of that as well. Uh, so there's you know aspects of that. It really is going to depend on what is your core facilities infrastructure so what is my core uh digital video routing switcher what is my core production routing switchers are these ip enabled systems does it make it sense to invest in an ip multi-view system um but certainly i as i as we work on newer projects greenfield type projects 
that are more leaning IP or even fully IP, IP multi-viewing is real slick. Uh, it makes things a lot easier. It's more highly, or sources are more highly available because again, now we're going out to this network instead of, which is the router. It's not just the, you know, this small network is only these few things. We really can see all of our sources. So there's real power behind IP multi-viewing. Um, but again, you need to make sure that your facility is actually capable of bringing that in and, and taking advantage of the power that that will give you. Yeah, and the, the, the manufacturer, uh, a number of manufacturers have embraced IP multi-viewing and are putting out fantastic uh, products. Um, you know, I, I've come across instances um, where you'll you'll you'd be in a, a TV station and the news director says, you know what, I would like to see the control rooms multi viewer on my computer or in the monitors in my office. Um, and and that's that's where you that's where you leverage the power of IP because then you build that into your own, you know, internal networks. But again, you have to be very careful when you're doing the network design to make sure that the network you have has the bandwidth to sustain, you know, that kind of high quality video throughput. Um, but I, I agree with Mason uh, more and more. Um, the uh, concept of the of IP multi viewers has has taken hold and um, been much more readily adopted because again too if you're on the right network and your news director is at home sick with a fever if they can hook in the uh, uh, you know a VPN to the to the station system they can see their multi viewers on the computers at home and and monitor what's going on so it's 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 a very powerful uh, very powerful technology. Awesome sauce. We'll go with one last question from Alec Turner. Um, outside of the software solutions like OBS and vMix um, and the Blackmagic ATEM lines, what options do it, you, do we as Kiko know about any of the new crop of small broadcasters, or I think it's items for switchers for small broadcasters that are giving production options to small venues, churches, and events? Well, we've we've had a lot of applications um, within churches, uh, particularly here in Denver, uh, where they're embracing either Telestream Wirecast gear or or the New Tech TriCaster systems. Um, uh, New Tech, especially as as they're evolving their TriCaster line, uh, is is adding more and more features um, so that. Um, you know, again, as, as I mentioned, a couple of daytime talk shows that we were supporting were being done on new tech TriCasters. Uh, so uh, they're, they're adding more and more features that, uh, that, that uh, give you higher production values um, and are quite easy to use, uh, whether, whether you control it from, uh, from a keyboard and mouse or you go to a more traditional two stripe or four stripe panel. Yeah, I've seen a lot of those little tools, you know, that software based, okay, install this application, put some sort of IO card on and bam, here I go, I'm, I'm mixing a show. Um, of the ones you named, Wirecast would definitely be one I would add to that. Um, I think that the, the crop up of so many of these is all courtesy of our you know, distributed nature of now we're not all in the office. We're not all sitting at the desk. We're not all in the production, you know, environment, um, especially as corporate has tried to struggle to solve these problems of like, well, we're, we're all, we love our meetings. We've done these meetings for, we have this weekly meeting. We do it every, every week and we've never always done it. We can't get rid of it, but we want to have everyone in the team see it. It's really proliferated all of these small, software startups that are creating tools such as OBS, such as Wirecast. Um, I, I've seen countless just deployed amongst corporate partners, especially doing AV types, type of projects. I don't think those are going away. Um, I think there's even more to come, to be honest. Um, I think that that's one of those pieces where we're going to start seeing uh, in, integration of multiple tools, which already happens of 
being able to lay in graphics, being able to handle records, being able to do playback of some pre-produced content. Um, and even seeing like, for example, uh, big players come down and create more inclusive tools that are software based that are a little more friendly or even cloud driven. Uh, Simply Live comes to mind, which I know was, I believe, formerly a, a few EBS engineers um, that had kind of dropped off and done the, a little something with their systems, which handles replay and graphics and production switching and streaming and capture and ingest, all sorts of things. So I think it's, you know, we've seen our manufacturers kind of get into that product line, um, but we've also seen from the offices and from the AV side of the world, a lot of developers building tools uh, that are starting to play in our game. Um, I think that that's going to happen more and more. Uh, I'm a, I like to see those tools. A lot of them are pretty clunky, so I absolutely recommend getting your hands on it, playing with it, vetting it, making sure it works for your uses. And that's also why you see Keycode keeps their line card quite small. We, you know, we're we're all about best of breed pet technology, and since a lot of this stuff is new and still growing legs and getting its feet underneath, um, it's not necessarily product lines you'll see Keycode pick up right away, but definitely product lines that, as they you know progress and grow, could very well end up playing more in our sandbox in the you know corporate education broadcasts, all of that side of, of the world. Very cool. And then that's the other thing. We, we also have folks that come in and they show us a solution for one one area of the industry. And we're like, no, wait, 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 let's let's take this and put this over here because we can do a lot of cool stuff with what you're talking about there. And that that's how, you know, that, that's why we're excited about technology. And we, you know, at Keycode, we try to keep you ahead of technology. But we haven't kept ahead of the clock. So we're out of time, guys. Uh, thanks for thanks for sitting down with us, uh, with everybody today and uh, hammering this out. I'm glad we were able to get uh, the, you know, behind the glass section taken care of uh, for all of this. Uh, again, if you've got any questions about uh, you know, getting a control room or a production facility up to speed, please give us a, a ring here at Keycode uh, you know, or, or hit us on the web. Uh, we're, we're pretty easy to find. Thanks for joining us today and see you all next time. <laughs>